Hello again, and welcome to our next module here in our class. What we're going to be doing in this module is shifting gears just a little bit. Uh, in the first couple of modules, we looked at um, our first textbook, uh, Sachs's book on theological anthropology. Uh, and while I'm sure we're still going to work some of the details out as we go along through the class, hopefully at this point you have uh, at least a basic idea of the Catholic worldview and how Catholic um, thought looks at the human person uh, and what makes up the human person, what are the, the key features uh, of the human person according to uh, Catholic uh, thinking. Uh, what I want to do now here in this third module is to, as I said, shift gears a little bit. Uh, and we're going to take the next step and then take that, that foundation we have of uh, this Catholic and Christian view of the world and the human person and then think about, okay, if we have this understanding of the human person, if we have this view uh, of the world, then how should we live in a way that's keeping with that? Uh, and this is really uh, in terms of the traditional um, areas of, of philosophy. We're going to be moving basically from metaphysics, that is studying uh, the nature of things, the nature of reality, and then moving on to look at ethics, that is, given a particular understanding of reality, um, what makes sense in terms of how we ought to live within that reality. So that's really what we're going to introduce uh, here in this module. And again, in this module, uh, and in the following one, as with the first couple of modules, I'm really just aiming to get a basic introduction here. Uh, really, we're going to work out and refine our understanding of ethics, and in particular uh, Catholic natural law ethics, uh, as we work through the specific um, specific topics that we're going to be looking at uh, in the second half of the course. Uh, so what I really want to do here is simply lay the foundation and give you a basic sense of what ethics is about and what natural law ethics is about uh, in particular. Uh, now before we can get to that, uh, we need to step back for a second and talk about ethics in general. Uh, and ethics is, again, a branch of uh, philosophy, uh, and it really focuses on uh, what we ought to do, uh, what we should or shouldn't do, or to put it a different way, what is moral or immoral, um, good or bad. Uh, and basically, a lot of people use morality and ethics more or less interchangeably, and they are more or less interchangeable terms. Uh, to be a little more careful about the way we use the words. Morality tends to uh, more specifically describe what are the morals, what are the, the, the basic beliefs and principles and rules that a particular group of people uh, hold and that they attempt to follow. So if we talk about our morality or our morals, um, we're talking about you know what is this body of rules, this body of ideas that guides a certain group's uh, behavior. Uh, and ethics is related to that. Ethics is really just kind of the careful study of morality, right? So that when we do ethics, what we're doing is uh, kind of systematically, academically studying those rules about how we should live. Uh, so if you're going to follow an ethical system, uh, that's going to be a little different than just talking about general morality. Right? General morality is... Um, something that we all do is something that we're all a part of in one or another moral system, if you will. Um, but it's not necessarily something we sit down and write about and think about and uh, really try to get very specific uh, in figuring out exactly what we believe. But that's what we do in ethics, right? Ethics is about uh, working out systematically, very carefully, what are the rules for how we should live. Uh, and it's even more specifically, what is it that makes something the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And that's something we're going to really be focusing on here in these first, or next couple of modules, I should say. And so when we're talking about different ethical systems, right, different uh, kind of detailed systems that people have developed for describing what's right or wrong, what we should or shouldn't do, uh, ethical systems fall into a bunch of different categories, but there's kind of two basic categories that all ethical systems fall into one or the other of. Uh, that is, they're either subjective or objective. Um, and hopefully, if you've had some philosophy before, this will be uh, just review. If not, uh, when we talk about subjective ethics, 
Uh, that means um, what makes things right or wrong uh, is the subject. That is, uh, the person who's making the judgment, the person who's uh, choosing to act one way or another, that it's within them that determines whether something is right or wrong, whether a certain action is right or wrong, or should or shouldn't be done. Um, this is also sometimes called ethical relativism, right, which simply says that uh, right or wrong, uh, should or shouldn't, uh, is relative to the person making the decision or the person uh, carrying out the action. Uh, another way to put this is to say uh, what makes things right or wrong is not any specific thing out there in the world. Uh, it's not a particular character or quality of the action itself. Uh, it's not the consequences of the action. It's not anything that a bunch of different people could look at and say, hey, look over there, that's what makes this action right or wrong. Um, when we talk about a subjective or a relative ethical system, that means uh, what makes things right or wrong is purely within the subject. Uh, and it's basically purely a matter of my, uh, my subjective uh, appraisal, my subjective judgment of the action. Do I believe, do I feel uh, that this action is right or wrong according to me, right? And so uh, a lot of times when you ask people you know, why is it that you uh, think something's right or wrong? If you kind of push the question and, and try to get them to really think about it, they'll come back to this. They'll say, well, look, I just feel like this is a wrong thing to do, or I feel like this is the right thing to do. Uh, and that's uh, a subjective um, ethical uh, statement, or that's following a subjective uh, ethical system. So in that sort of system, it just comes down to what do you believe? What do you think? What do you um, feel? Uh, and if you think about it, right, that's going to mean, as probably we all have experienced, that if you have two different people who feel differently about an action, uh, there's not going to be really any effective way to reach an agreement. Right? If I feel uh, doing this is wrong and you feel doing this right, if we both hold this ethical system, um, there's not really anywhere else for us to go because we both think right or wrong is determined by our feelings. Uh, and if I feel one way and you feel another, I might try to persuade you to feel differently, but if you don't, we're really at an impasse and we just have to agree to disagree or impose our will on the other person. There's no way to really take the argument uh, any further in that sort of situation. And of course, one of the real challenges uh, with holding a, a subjective or relativist ethical system is precisely this, that uh, we can't really argue uh, that somebody else is wrong who feels differently about certain actions. And so, uh, stereotypically, when you're in a typical class discussion about this, uh, the example that comes up uh, is often Hitler. Right? So was uh, Hitler's uh, launching of the Holocaust wrong? Well, obviously, most, the vast majority of people are going to say, yes, it was wrong. The Holocaust uh, was wrong. But why is it wrong? Right? If it's only wrong because I've been conditioned to feel that it's wrong, or for whatever reason I feel that it's wrong, and uh, the Nazis did not feel that it was wrong, uh, there's no way to uh, really produce a compelling argument that it is in fact wrong, even though they didn't feel that way. Or we can use examples of racism, as we can also see here on the page, or slavery, or whatever, um, that uh, with ethical relativism, uh, if somebody feels differently, uh, we can't really argue that, no, you might think slavery and racism are okay, but you are wrong. Uh, if we're really committed to the idea that ethical judgments are purely about feelings and opinions, I can't really make that claim. I can't argue that you're wrong if that's the way you feel. So for most people, this is a significant problem with subjective ethics. Um, it really means that we can't tell anyone that they are wrong. And, you know, you could come up with the uh, most uh, outrageous uh, wrongdoer that you can imagine, whether it's child abusers or rapists or what have you. Uh, if we really are going to be committed ethical relativists, at a certain level, we can't say, even though you think that's right, it is in fact wrong.
Uh, so I'm going to argue that's a significant, really fatal flaw for an ethical system. Uh, and so we're going to uh, leave subjective ethics behind and move on to uh, focus in this course on objective ethical systems. Right? And so one way to say what an object of ethical system is, it's just the opposite of everything that we said about subjective ethics. Uh, this means that what makes things right or wrong is not just the feelings or beliefs inside the person making the judgment, but in fact it's something out there in the world that multiple people can uh, see and get access to, uh, and we can base our judgment on uh, this quality or this something out in the world. Uh, this also means that we can, in fact, have uh, arguments, productive arguments, about whether something is right or wrong. Right? If it's the consequences of something that makes it right or wrong, a whole bunch of us can look at the consequences and uh, make our arguments and say, look, these uh, consequences show that this was wrong or that this was right, and we can debate about what the consequences actually are. Or we can look at the nature of this action and say, look at this action, this is a kind of action that's wrong, uh, and we can argue about that and reach, uh, hopefully, a conclusion. This is also going to mean, something that we'll talk about more as we go along, that our own ethical uh, opinions and judgments can be wrong. Right? That just because I think something is right or I feel like something is right doesn't make it right. In fact, I can be wrong in my belief and in my judgment uh, if I'm committed to uh, an objective ethical system. Uh, and it also means um, that, well, rather I should say, uh, this does not mean, though, of course, that everybody is going to agree, right? That there are going to be uh, many disagreements still about ethics, even from people who say, yes, there is an objective basis for ethics. Uh, this is going to come for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, even if we agree what makes things right or wrong, uh, we can be more or less effective in figuring that out, right? That sometimes it can be kind of complicated to figure out what the right thing is to do. And even if we agree on basic principles, we might disagree in how they apply to a complex case. More importantly, and more basically for the moment, uh, there can be different kinds of objective ethical systems. Um, so some people could say it's the consequences that matter, some people could say it's the nature of the act, some people could say uh, it's uh, whether or not God has forbidden it or commanded it in the Bible. Uh, and so to talk about some of those different objective ethical systems, uh, I want to turn now to the next page. Now the most important uh, non-religious objective ethical system that we're going to be referring to throughout the remainder of the course uh, is utilitarianism. We've already talked uh, really briefly about utilitarianism uh, in one of the introductory uh, modules, but I wanted to give it a little more of an intro here because we'll be referring to it uh, on a fairly regular basis as we move um, through the class. Uh, as I talked about before, utilitarianism is an objective ethical system, uh, and it bases uh, its judgment of whether actions are right or wrong by looking at uh, their consequences. Uh, so utilitarianism is a specific form of consequentialism, right? which is, uh, I'm sure you can deduce, uh, ethical systems that believe right and wrong is based on the consequences. But this is a particular form of that which looks at the utility of certain actions. Uh, now utility here doesn't just mean uh, how useful it is, uh, like you might think. Um, really, utilitarianism focuses on uh, the balance of pleasure and pain uh, produced by a particular um, action. And so, um, obviously, what we want to do is to maximize the amount of pleasure and minimize the amount of pain. And so, when we're faced with a choice, uh, whether to do A or B, or I'm in this particular situation, what should I do? Uh, the right choice, the right action, is always going to be the one that maximizes pleasure and minimizes pain uh, for the total uh, set of people that are affected by my decision. All right, so what we need to do is look at all the pleasure and pain uh, produced by an action and then sort of tally it up uh, and choose the course of action that's going to produce the best ratio of pleasure and pain uh, for everyone that's going to be affected uh, by an action. Uh, and again, 
this may, we probably don't talk about it this way on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm sure you've encountered this uh, many times and probably used this many times uh, in moral decisions in everyday life, right? Of lots of the arguments that we're going to look at over the course of the semester uh, are of this kind, right? Well, look, this is the right way to um, produce food because it's going to produce uh, the most amount of food, the most profit, uh, with the least amount of labor uh, and the least amount of struggle and suffering, and so that's the right thing to do. Um, or, as I mentioned before, um, people use utilitarian arguments uh, based on the pleasure and pain felt by animals to say that we shouldn't use certain kinds of uh, practices in raising animals. And I give you here on the page a picture of uh, Peter Singer, who again is the very famous utilitarian, uh, who is also uh, an outspoken animal rights advocate. Uh, and you can see him here conferring with uh, one, of his, uh, one of his farm friends here. Um, so uh, utilitarianism, again, maximizing pleasure, minimizing pain. Uh, and we'll flesh this out as we move through the course. I did want to, though, I just mention a couple of things really quickly because um, in my experience with students, um, think about utilitarianism or write about it. They tend to make some uh, basic mistakes about what utilitarianism is or what it um, says. So I want to just go over those real quickly before we move on uh, to the next uh, ethical system. And that first thing is to note that utilitarianism is not inherently selfish. Uh, right? A lot of people hear this idea and for some reason they think then that utilitarianism says, well, I should do whatever is going to give me the most pleasure and give me the least amount of pain. Um, and that's part of utilitarianism, but that's not what utilitarianism says is what we should do. That's not what makes things right or wrong according to utilitarianism. Uh, that would essentially just be a kind of kind of relativism or uh, not really an ethical system, right? It's all about my pleasure uh, and my pain. The utilitarianism says when you're making these moral judgments or choosing to act one way or another, you have to consider everyone who is affected uh, by this action. Now, you know, we could weight it perhaps. There's going to be maybe some people who are really directly impacted uh, and it might, their pleasure and pain might be more intense and therefore matter more in our, our calculations, but we can't just focus on uh, the immediate people effect. We also have to look at uh, the people who are extended, uh, part of an extended group that's going to be affected by particular action or particular choice. Uh, and so sometimes utilitarianism is going to tell us uh, that the right action is one that's actually going to cause us pain uh, and not give us any pleasure. Because when we look at the uh, effects of the action, when we consider everyone, it's going to produce the overall best balance of pleasure and pain. Uh, so utilitarianism can, in many cases, tell us that we need to do something that's going to be painful or unpleasant for ourselves because it's going to produce the best overall balance of pleasure and pain for everyone affected by that action. Uh, so this is not simply saying do whatever makes you feel good uh, by any stretch of the imagination. The other thing to uh, clarify is that utilitarianism is not hedonism. Right? Hedonism is uh, basically the view that says uh, really the only thing you should focus on is getting as much physical pleasure as possible, right? And I recall um, looking through travel magazines one time in, in a doctor's office and it came across um, ads for some resorts, I think in the Bahamas or in the Caribbean somewhere. Uh, the resort is actually called hedonism, uh, right? And, you know, hedonism uh, is precisely the kind of pleasure you would imagine uh, you would have uh, at these Caribbean resorts, right? Hedonism is, is drinking, uh, and eating well, sexual pleasure would fall into hedonism, um, all these kinds of bodily pleasures that people do tend to seek. Um, now utilitarianism would say, yes, obviously bodily pleasures are a good thing, and that those would count towards um, being a positive, towards making a certain choice or pursuing a certain action. But utilitarianism isn't only about these kind of bodily pleasures, right? Uh, very, from the very beginning of utilitarianism, uh, 
with philosophers like John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham um, several hundred years ago. Uh, they argued that, especially Mill, that there are higher and lower pleasures, right? So that uh, a high pleasure might be something like the pleasure one gets from a successful career or from good family life or from um, education, right? And we need to um, take those kinds of pleasures into consideration and, in fact, give them more weight uh, than bodily pleasures, right? So utilitarianism will not say, for example, okay, it's Friday night, I could either go out and party or I could uh, get started studying for my finals, which start on Monday and which are really important to my education and career and supporting my future family. Um, utilitarianism isn't going to tell you Oh, we'll go out and party because obviously that's going to give you pleasure and studying is going to give you pain. Um, you need to take a broader picture and look at the higher pleasures that are at stake. Uh, and utilitarianism could very well tell you uh, what you need to do is sacrifice these lower temporary pleasures that you would get from partying. Uh, because by doing so, you're going to gain the higher pleasures of education, successful career, good family life, uh, and those sorts of things. So we need to be careful we don't think of utilitarianism just as uh, go enjoy yourself uh, in a kind of bodily sense. It can be uh, much more sophisticated than that. Um, and then the last thing to note is that there are there are a lot of different types of utilitarianism, and scholars come up with their own tweaks on the theory all the time. But one basic um, distinction to keep in mind is that there are uh, is act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. So act utilitarianism would say um, what makes things right or wrong is judging each act individually, one at a time. Okay, in this action, what's going to produce the most pleasure and the least amount of pain uh, with all the things that we clarified before. Uh, other utilitarian, utilitarians rather, uh, will say uh, we can't just look at individual acts. We need to look at rules of behavior, right? So uh, the problem with utilitarianism and the argument raised against it many times is that um, it seems like it can produce situations where you sacrifice individuals or minorities um, who are going to suffer uh, in this action, but if that's going to produce pleasure or good for a much larger group of people, then it seems like utilitarianism will tell us to sacrifice uh, the individual or the minority. Um, and rule utilitarianism is an attempt to get around that, to say that um, it's not like we could just set up a society where we randomly kill people for entertainment, and yes, they suffer, but if millions of people get a lot of uh, pleasure from watching it happen, then utilitarianism tells us to do it. A uh, rule utilitarianism would say, uh, well, in this sort of situation, yes, in that individual action, it might produce more pleasure than pain. But we also have to think about the fact that what we're doing is setting up a society where people know that they might be the next person to get picked to be um, killed on live TV, right? And that setting that up as a rule within our society is going to have lots of negative effects, and it's going to make people apprehensive, uh, and it might cause division in society, and cause all kinds of other problems. So that we need to think about what setting this up as a rule of behavior would mean. Um, so rule utilitarianism tries to get uh, around that particular problem with act utilitarianism. Uh, now, again, we can talk about this more as it comes up during the class. Personally, I think uh, rule utilitarianism doesn't really ultimately address that problem, uh, but we can talk about that more on the discussion board if you're interested in it. Hopefully for now, though, we have at least enough of an understanding of what utilitarianism is uh, that we can... Um, use it and refer to it uh, as another way of making ethical decisions as we go through the rest of the class. All right, so we've looked at utilitarianism. Now what I want to do is turn to uh, religious ethics. Utilitarianism uh, is really a non-religious ethical system, although obviously uh, many Christians and other religious believers uh, use utilitarianism. But it's not specifically religious. Uh, what I want to focus on here are uh, religious ethical systems. Right? And really, um, there are two 
uh, ethical systems I want to consider here, uh, divine command theory and, and natural law. Um, and uh, in terms of just thinking about uh, our American culture and our society and how we have a dialogue and debates about how we ought to live, um, we've really covered the major ethical um, positions uh, that are working in our society uh, with this group of systems, right? There's a lot of relativism out there, although, again, I don't think that's uh, a terribly helpful uh, way of doing ethics. There's a lot of utilitarianism that's used uh, by people every day and also by academics uh, and scholars when we debate issues in society. And then I think the remainder of, or the majority of the remaining people uh, in our society fall into one of these uh, religious ethical systems. Uh, now, uh, when we think about, and here I'm going to be focusing specifically on Christianity, both because it's, it's the largest religious group in our society uh, by a significant margin, and also because uh, that's going to be our focus here in the class. Um, but Christian ethics really falls into two uh, distinct groups, right? Divine command theory and natural law theory. Uh, and the difference, the basic difference between these two groups, uh, we can trace back to Plato, who obviously predates Christianity and wasn't a Christian, but he asked a very important question about religious ethics uh, that applies here. And uh, maybe some of you had Plato and the youthful problem in a previous course, uh, but just in case you haven't, um, Plato asked this question in one of his dialogues called the Euthyphro, uh, and it's uh, the biggest question in the biggest, yeah, I guess, question in uh, philosophy, religion, particularly in ethics. Uh, and Plato asks there, and I'm giving you a, a paraphrased version of it, but basically asks, are certain actions or acts good uh, because God commands them, or does God command certain acts because they're good? Uh, and this is a very important uh, distinction when it comes to religious ethics, right? Does God tell us to do certain things, and that makes those things good to do? Or are there certain things that are good to do, so God says, do these things, because they're already good to do before God commands them? Uh, and obviously, you could make this uh, negative as well, right? Are certain things uh, wrong to do because God says, don't do them? Or does God say, don't do certain things because they are wrong? And obviously, there's two different ways of answering this question. You can go with the first option or the second option. Uh, and if you go with the first option, that certain actions are good because God commands them, that is, not surprisingly, divine command theory. Right. So one major branch in Christian ethics is divine command theory, which says it is God's commands that determine whether things are right or wrong, right? And if God hasn't commanded or forbidden it, it's basically morally neutral. Um, right, so for Christians, um, where is the most obvious place to look for God's commands? Uh, well, obviously, it's the Bible, right? And so a divine command theory tends to, in a Christian context, tends to focus on the Bible. and says, uh, basically... Uh, the foundations of our ethical choices can be found in looking at the Bible and seeing what God commands and what God uh, forbids. Now, you obviously could also get private commands from God, which people have claimed throughout time, uh, but there are all kinds of questions about whether we should believe those or accept those, certainly when other people say they've got them. So people tend to focus on uh, the Bible as really the, the Christian uh, compendium of God's commands uh, both commanding things and forbidding certain things. Um, now, uh, this when we think about kind of the divisions in, in American Christianity, um, there's primarily Catholics and Protestants. There's also Eastern Orthodox Christians, um, but they make up a relatively small number. Uh, most American Christians are either Catholic or Protestant. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, Catholics and Protestants um, fall, for the most part, fall into different camps when we come to this question. Uh, and so, given what we've talked about so far in terms of divine command theory, it's probably not too surprising that uh, this tends to be more of a Protestant approach to Christian ethics.
Uh, if you recall, you know, one of Luther's primary points in his criticism of the Catholic Church was that uh, Scripture alone should be our primary authority. So there's kind of a natural fit uh, between that kind of Protestant focus on Scripture and divine command theory, which sees Scripture or the Bible as uh, the primary basis for making our ethical decisions. Um, so for the most part, divine command theorists tend to be uh, Protestant. Now, what are some of the advantages of this as an ethical system? Well, first of all, uh, look, it's there in black and white. Uh, and in some Bibles, some of the parts red. Um, but, you know, thou shalt not uh, commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Uh, it's written right there. Uh, so one of the advantages is, uh, look, it's very concrete uh, in many cases. You can say, it, look, God says don't do this. God says do this. Um, there you go. Right? It also has obviously built into it uh, motivation. Right? Typically when God says do these things, uh, he promises rewards, whether it's rewards in this life or ultimately a reward of heaven. And when he forbids certain things, he tends to say you're going to be punished if you do this, either in this life or eternally uh, in hell. So there's motivation built uh, right into it as well. Uh, and for many Christians also, the idea that uh, what's right or wrong ultimately rests in God's commands, this fits very well with uh, Christian piety to uh, kind of give God uh, the ultimate authority over everything. Now, uh, what are some of the challenges for divine command theory? Well, uh, one of the challenges is uh, it's not terribly effective when you're arguing with people who don't accept the Bible as... Uh, God's revelation to human beings, right? So if you have somebody who's not a Christian, uh, who doesn't believe the Bible is divinely inspired, uh, they're not going to be very motivated to accept your arguments um, that A, B, or C is uh, wrong because the Bible says so. Um, if they don't believe the Bible to be divinely inspired, that's not going to be persuasive evidence for them. So that's one challenge. Uh, another is that there are many things uh, that the Bible doesn't really address. Uh, you know, uh, embryonic stem cell research was not an issue uh, in biblical times. So what is the uh, right course of action when it comes to the question of whether or not we should do embryonic stem cell research? It can be a bit of a challenge uh, to answer that from the Bible. Now obviously you can argue, well look, there are certain principles we can find in the Bible that apply here. Uh, and that certainly is what many Christians do. The problem is that makes it a little less direct, right? That moves us away from that advantage of this ethical system that says we are following God's commands written in the Bible. Uh, and it tends to get us uh, a little more involved in philosophy and reasoning. It moves us away from kind of the essence of divine command theory. Um, uh, and of course, one of the other challenges is the opposite, that there are uh, commands we find in the Bible that uh, even most divine command theorists today would say we shouldn't do. So, for example, we tend not to uh, drag rebellious teenagers to the city gates and stone them, uh, even though that's commanded, um, at least at one point in the Old Testament. Now, again, there are reasons that divine command theorists can give for why we don't do that today. Uh, and many Christians would argue that there are parts of the Old Testament that don't apply after the coming of Jesus. But this requires us to uh, get into questions of interpretation and to say, um, well, look, there are some commands that we take literally. There are some commands that we get a basic idea from but don't follow word for word. Uh, and then there's other uh, commands that, we, um, that no longer really apply to our lives. Uh, and again, this raises a lot of complexity and questions in terms of if we're going to say we are driven by God's commands, um, it seems to be a problem if we bring in a whole bunch of human reasoning about which of these commands apply and which of them apply literally or not. Um, so those are some of the, the strengths and also challenges of divine command theory. Uh, and we will come back to, to scripture as we go through the class. Um, but what we're going to focus on uh, primarily for the remainder of the course is the other uh, answer to the youthful problem for Christians. Uh, which is natural law theory, which says God commands certain things because 
they are inherently um, good. And so to talk about that, we will turn to the next page. So uh, when we think about what natural law theory is, right, it's basically saying um, certain things, certain actions are right or wrong uh, simply because of the very nature of the act. Uh, and it's not because God said, don't do this or do this. Um, now, one thing to say here uh, before we get any farther is that this doesn't mean Catholics don't think uh, the Bible is important for making good moral decisions. Um, there are a lot of instances where, um, yes, the Bible does give us uh, very good, very clear guidance for um, how we ought to live. Right? But the difference is that uh, from a natural law perspective, um, if you really kind of push the point, uh, what we would say is that um, it's not the Bible verses, it's not the commands that make these things right or wrong. Right? God tells us these things uh, because sometimes it can be hard to figure out which actions are right or wrong. Right? And so uh, the Bible just kind of clarifies uh, the nature of certain actions uh, and kind of gives us a little extra push to do the right thing. But it's not the commands that make the certain actions right or wrong. But the Bible is going to, uh, as long as we interpret it correctly, is going to give us uh, guidance that fits with the nature of things. All right, so what is natural law? And we've already um, touched on it in some of the previous modules, so this might be kind of just getting us back up to speed here. But basically it's saying, uh, what we can do is look at the nature of things, right? Look at the, the nature of the world, look at the nature of human persons, uh, and we can figure out from understanding that nature properly how we ought to live, right? And to kind of make it uh, as simple as we possibly can, we could say, uh, well, let's look at the starting point, you know, where is it that we as human beings begin, uh, and then look at the end and say, what is it that we're aiming for? What's our goal or our end that we're working toward? Uh, and then it's simply a question of saying, okay, if we have this beginning and this end, how do I get from here over to this point? Right? What are gonna, what's going to be the right path to get me where I want to go? Right? And that's really kind of what a natural law is really about. Uh, and again, I, I often use the example of uh, like a hair dryer, right? That... Um, you know, if we kind of know what hair dryers are, but we've never really used one and haven't uh, uh, spent a lot of time, uh, you know, primping in front of a mirror with a hair dryer, um, you know, it could be a little confusing. But I think given some time and, and carefully thinking about it, we could figure it out, right? You can look at the nature of the thing. You can, can see the plug on it. Oh, I've seen these before. You plug it into uh, those two little holes in the wall. We can try that. We can say, hey, this turns on. It blows hot air out of it. Hey, what could we do with this? Uh, and you could figure out um, what it is that you're supposed to do. Uh, and, of course, if you also have uh, the goal in mind and say, well, look, I, I said I needed to make, you know, my hair nice and fluffy. Um, somebody gave me this hair dryer. I've kind of seen how it works. I want to make my hair nice and fluffy. So I got this thing that blows the hot air. I got my hair. Okay, look, I, what I should do is, you know, point this at my head and, run a comb through it, and voila, I'm going to have, you know, nice, fluffy, poofy hair, whatever it is that's, you know, the thing that we ought to be doing today. Of course, back in, in my junior high days, the thing to do was, you know, uh, the girls had those bangs that were about 8 to 10 inches tall, and there was an unfortunate perm period at one point in my junior high years, but thankfully I think all the photographic evidence for that has been destroyed. Uh, but all that to say... Look, given the way a hair dryer works, and given that my goal is to uh, blow dry my hair, um, there's just a certain way that I should do this or shouldn't do this. Um, for example, you know, holding it so that the end of the hair dryer is actually pushing against my head, this is not going to work well, right? Why not? Well, it turns out that if you do that, it kind of, you know, catches your hair on fire and or burns your head. So we need to hold it a little bit away. You know, now if I hold it, you know, at full arm's length, that's not going to work very well either because, you know, not enough air actually makes it to my hair. So we're going to find, look, there is a, a proper zone in which I should hold the hair dryer uh, to get the job done. And again, this is basically what natural law does. It says, what kind of things are human beings? 
all right, we, we said they're, they're creatures, they've been made by a god on purpose and that they're basically good. We're going to say, look, they're this uh, undividable combination of body and soul together, so they're embodied persons. And look, they're relational. These, these kinds of beings have to be in relationships with each other and with God to, to function properly, to grow properly. And so we can look at those basic qualities. We can say, where is it that they're heading? Well, their ultimate goal is to, um, to, to, to develop and grow into uh, creatures that, um, from a Christian perspective, are going to be entering into a new heaven and earth, and they're going to be in uh, direct relationship with God in the beatific vision. Uh, which is going to require really a focus on relationships, a focus on um, loving other people. But even if we don't have the Christian uh, perspective, we could say, well, look, what's a, a flourishing, successful human being like? Well, there's somebody who is in control of their bodily desires. They don't overeat or overdrink. Um, they are people who have good relationships in their work and in their family. Uh, they're people who... Uh, enjoy art and sports and, and the life of the mind, right? And we could probably sit down and come up with some of the basic characteristics of what um, a flourishing, successful, ideal kind of person would be. Now, obviously, there would be some differences in emphasis, but, you know, a rich old miser who, who uses everyone just to get more money is probably not going to fit almost anyone's de depiction of what a good human life is. And so if we're Christian, or even if we're not Christian, and can just think about what a good life is, we can have some sense of, of what our goal is. Right? So we can say, okay, how do we get these creatures who are embodied persons, who are deeply relational, how do we get them to this uh, ultimate goal of, of being in heaven with God, or of leading a flourishing, successful life with good family and career relationships and all those things? And that's what natural law does, right? Natural law is kind of the instructions or the directions to get you from A to B. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, uh, at least from a Christian perspective, we don't have to do it all on our own either. We can consult the instructions given to us in the Bible. Or if we're not Christian, right, we can also say, well, look, people have been thinking about what's the right way to live in lots of different cultures throughout basically most of history, so we can look at all these different cultures, all these different uh, philosophers and historians, uh, and really try to get together, you know, what are the common themes we can find about how we ought to live? Uh, and that's how we're going to do natural law, is looking at human life, looking at how human beings have lived successfully and in a flourishing way throughout lots of different cultures, throughout lots of history, uh, and then come up with some principles and guidelines for how we live. And that's really the essence of natural law. All right, so um, we've kind of talked about what natural law basically is, right? Now what we need to do is to start to give a little more detail, flesh things out a little more sub substantively uh, in explaining how natural law works. Um, and I think maybe the first place to start is with talking about, well, what are moral acts, right? So moral acts are uh, really kind of, one way to look at it would be kind of any action that's either moving us toward our goal or away from our goal, right? So moral act is not going to be, for example, do I choose chocolate or vanilla? Right? Whether I choose chocolate or vanilla is not really relevant to whether I'm becoming more and more like this kind of full, fulfilled, flourishing person that I'm supposed to be. Chocolate and vanilla is not moving me closer to that or away from it. It's, it's irrelevant, right? So a moral act is going to be um, something we're choosing to do that's either moving us closer or further away from our goal. It's either acting in keeping with the way we were made or against the way we were made. Right? And from the perspective of natural law, uh, it's really the nature of actions themselves themselves that determine whether they are right or wrong. Right? So to take us back a couple of pages, natural law is clearly an objective moral system. Right? And it's going to say, what makes things right or wrong is the nature of certain actions themselves. Right? So it's not really the consequences necessarily. 
Um, it's just the very nature of the action. Is this the kind of action that fits with our nature, fits with our goals, or doesn't? Right, to go back to the hair dryer example, um, right, using the hair dryer in the bathtub is going to be something we shouldn't do, right? And we don't not do it because of, you know, uh, some some random rule, right? It's not because the, the manufacturer puts the little tag on the cord with the bathtub and, and the big, you know, no sign through it, right? We don't do it, we don't use the hair dryer in the bathtub because of the very nature of the action, right? Because this is an electric appliance and if we use it in the bathtub, electricity will go through um, the, the, the quickest route to the ground, uh, which in this case is us in the bathtub, which means we get electrocuted. And so because of the very nature of the thing and the act of using it, we shouldn't do that, right? And that's basically what natural law says as well. There are certain actions that are good and fit with our nature and other actions that don't. Um, now, how do we decide which actions are good and which actions aren't? Um, and again, this is going to be complicated. We're going to work through this uh, in the next module more as we go through the course. Uh, but to start off our discussion, right, people using natural law tend to break actions into three components, right? So when we're going to look at an action, we can divide it into three parts. There's the object, the intention, and the circumstances. All right, first of all, there's the object. Now, this is a little confusing because this doesn't mean the thing I'm acting on, right? If I'm kicking a soccer ball, you might, the soccer ball, in one sense, is the object of the action. But that's not what we mean by object here. What we mean when we use object in this context is um, the object is the, the actual act as intended, right? So should I or should I not shoot this person? Right? The object is um, shooting this person, right? or particularly, um, we need to flesh that out a little more, right? because if you'll notice, it's not just an action, it's an act as intended. Right? So this is an important difference. So shooting a person is not a sufficient description of the act, uh, because there are lots of different ways, different intended acts of shooting a person. So for example, um, if I'm shooting a person um, because, look, they've got really nice shoes and I would like to have those, uh, so if I'm intentionally killing a person to take their shoes, um, if I'm intentionally killing an innocent person, that's an act as intended, right? Intentionally killing an innocent person. Um, uh, and that object, that act is intrinsically wrong, right? Whenever we, um, if the the object of an action, if the act is intended, uh, is, is intrinsically wrong, like intentionally harming an innocent person, then the act as a whole is wrong, regardless of the intention or the circumstances. Um, but there can be other situations where we shoot a person where it wouldn't necessarily be wrong. Uh, and now you're probably wondering where this picture came from and why. Um, well, often in class, I, I will talk about this point by saying, look, if I'm out hunting, uh, and I see antlers in a body kind of behind some brush over there, um, and, and I shoot, um, but it turns out that it was some guy wearing an antler helmet. Well, look, um, I just shot a human person, uh, but that was not my act as intended. Right? My act as intended was um, to shoot uh, a deer, or I think in this case it's got to be an elk or something because those are some big antlers. Um, but whatever the case may be, right? My act is uh, this is a different act than intentionally shooting an innocent person, right? This is an act of uh, attempting to shoot uh, an elk and, and accidentally hitting a person, All right? So the shooting a person is not a sufficient description. We have to get we have to build into that a little bit. What is the act as intended? So, for example, right? Uh, if I just come up to you and cut off your arm because I don't like you and I like to watch people suffer. Um, that's one kind of act. And now if I'm a doctor and we're in a hospital and you have a deadly infection in your arm and the only way to save your life is to cut it off, that's a different act. right? One is cutting off someone's arm uh, for sadistic pleasure. Another is cutting off a person's arm to save their life. That's what we mean by act as intended. 
All right. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, um, this is the most important part of the act, right? So if the act itself, by its very nature, is wrong or immoral, the intention and circumstances might change how severely we judge somebody for doing something wrong, but it will never make the action right, right? So if, I, if my, the act I'm talking about is intentionally killing an innocent person, it doesn't matter what my intentions are. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. That action is always wrong. Um, now, there are other actions where the intentions and circumstances can change whether the act is, is good. Uh, and basically, uh, to make a morally good act, we need all three of these to be good, right? Uh, for an action to be wrong, you only need to have one of them be wrong. And again, I'll, we'll talk about this more and have a lot more examples as we go along. Um, I'm just trying to introduce you to these ideas here. All right, so when we talk about the intention, uh, obviously this has to be a little different than the intention built into act as intended. All right, so here we're saying um, the intention is kind of what are my, my medium and long-term goals in doing this, um, right? So, for example, let's say I'm giving money to a hospital, um, right? Well, what's my intention? Uh, well, my intention could either be I want to help the sick and the poor, um, or my intention could be uh, I want to make myself look good because uh, my um, ex-wife is making me look bad and, and it, things aren't going so well in my divorce proceedings. So I want to look present myself as, as a, an outstanding guy, even though I'm, I'm really not. Right. So those are two different kinds of intentions that would maybe in the first case uh, say, yes, this is a moral act, a good act. And in the other second case, um, uh, even though I am giving money to a hospital, my intentions aren't good, and therefore the act overall is not good. Right? And then lastly, we can look at circumstances. Right? So circumstances, again, these become most important, uh, particularly when somebody does something that's wrong. Uh, but uh, not everyone who does something wrong uh, deserves the same level of judgment or the same uh, level of punishment. Right, so uh, if I intentionally shoot an innocent human person uh, just because I wanted to and I like watching people suffer, that's one thing. If I intentionally shoot an innocent human person because somebody else is holding a gun to my head saying, I'm going to kill you if you don't shoot that person, that's uh, an important change in circumstances. Right now, again, kind of on, on one level, we would say you still shouldn't do that. It's still wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human person. However, in this case, the circumstances um, are going to affect our overall judgment of this person. We're going to say, well, look, that was still wrong to do, but we're certainly not going to judge you as severely as somebody who just shot somebody um, for fun. And so basically, um, when we're talking about moral acts and trying to judge whether they're right or wrong, whether we should or shouldn't do them, uh, and kind of the big picture, we're going to say, is this action going to get me closer to my goal, closer to becoming the kind of person I ought to be or that I want to be ultimately? Um, and kind of uh, on a more microscopic level, kind of looking at the action very specifically, um, we're going to say, okay, well, what is the act as intended? What is it that you did? Um, what is your intention in doing that? And what were the circumstances? And if all of those things are good, this is a good act that's going to help you get towards the goal of being a fully flourishing human person. If it's a bad act, it's going to be moving you away from those things. Um, all right, so to kind of round out the picture a little more, uh, we'll turn now to the next page. Okay, so we've looked at kind of the big picture of natural law and Catholic ethics. Uh, and we've looked at, okay, let's take, let's pick apart a specific act to see whether it's good or bad. Um, what is in between, right? You know, it, we don't go through most of our life, uh, every time we make an action or, or make a choice, saying, okay, I need to sit back, I need to think about, well, what is the object, the act is intended, what is the intention, what is the circumstance, um, right? We just don't make every action and choice in our life that way. 
right? Most of what we do, that we don't really reflect on that deeply. Now, it's important to be able to do that when we're making big decisions. Uh, but a lot of our actions in life, and even a lot of our moral actions, we don't do that with, right? We just do it. Uh, and we do it, in most cases, out of habit, right? That I just tend to act this way, or I tend to act that way. Right? And this is an essential part of, of natural law, uh, right? Because we don't sit down and have this detailed calculation and reflection before every action. Um, what we do as human beings is we, we start to make certain choices, and then we do that, and then we do it again. Before we know it, we have formed a habit, right? And this is true not just of like chewing on pencils or having a couple of cups of coffee in the morning. This is also true of our moral actions, right? So that we become the kind of people who hold the door open for other people or not, or we become the kind of people who um, give money to charity or not. Um, and we form the, these habits by choosing a particular action once, then twice, then three times, and right, as we all know, the more we do a certain thing, the easier it gets and the more entrenched the habit gets. And this is an essential part of the moral life, right, because what we do by carefully choosing the right thing one time, and then, okay, we do that again, and we do that again, at a certain point, we get to the point where we don't have to go through this hard decision-making process to come to the right choice we develop a good habit, right? And in natural law, we call these things virtues, right? So that I don't have to choose to be patient um, when somebody cuts me off in line at, at Dylan's or uh, when somebody's taking forever in front of me uh, on Kellogg, right? That I become over time a patient person, right? By choosing over and over again to, okay, I'm gonna stay patient, I'm not gonna get upset, that becomes part of my nature. I become a patient person, or I become a, a charitable person, or I become um, a trustworthy person, right? I keep people's secrets, or, or whatever it might be, right? And so, um, you know, how is it that I get to be like God so that I can be with him in heaven? Or how do I become this fully realized, flourishing human person who has good career and good family and educated and all those things? Well, you, again, you don't make that kind of long-term choice every action in life. You, the way you get to those goals is to develop the virtues, to become just, to become prudent, to become patient, to become um, charitable. And if you develop those virtues, you will uh, develop your nature to the point where you become the person who is at that goal, right? Um, and so the opposite, though, is also true, right? That if we choose wrongly, and then choose wrongly again and again and again, we can develop bad habits, right? And these are the vices. So that if I choose to blow up and get angry at somebody when they cut me off, and if I choose to do that again and again and again, I eventually become a wrathful, angry person. Or I can choose to be the kind of person who, okay, I told somebody's secret to somebody else, and then I did it again, I did it again. Eventually, I'm not trustworthy. I'm deceitful, um, right? And that as you develop those bad habits, it's going to move you further and further away from becoming the kind of person that you ultimately ought to become. Um, and again, I think I, I used, talked about in one of the earlier modules um, that the moral life is like lots of other aspects of life, right? That um, if we work hard, if we establish good habits at the beginning, we, it becomes part of our nature and it becomes easier and easier and you actually are able to flourish and succeed in whatever field it is you're in, right? So if I sit down at a piano again, um, without having developed the virtues of a pianist, I can't really do much. If I make good choices over and over again, I can be an accomplished pianist and then I have the freedom to play whatever I want. Right? And for the vices, the opposite is true. Right? That if I want to be an athlete, but what I do is over and over again choose to lay on my couch and drink beer, over time, what's going to happen is that becomes my habit. I become slothful. I become gluttonous. 
Um, and um, I actually lose the ability to be an athlete, right? Our, our fellow here on the sofa, he can't just hop up and go out and play a really vigorous uh, game of basketball or run a race, right? That the choices he's made, the habits he's developed have made it um, harder and harder, maybe even ultimately impossible for him to do certain things, right? So natural law would say our moral life is the same way. If we make bad choices over and over again, uh, we make ourselves less free. We make it harder and harder for us to be the kind of people we ought to be and to reach the goals that we all ultimately want to uh, attain. All right, so I realize that I've thrown a lot of information at you, um, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, please don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, I'm kind of dumping all this natural law stuff on you in this module. I'm going to work back through some of these ideas uh, in more detail in the next module. We'll also look at the readings, which will help. Uh, and then also, we're going to be using natural law as we go through the whole rest of the course uh, and as we apply it to specific situations in our class, that's when a lot of the detail will come out. So what I want you to really focus on now is to try to start thinking about this is on a basic level, um, and we'll get the detail and some of the nuances as we go along.